Good afternoon, and welcome to the ASPPH Presents webinar series. My name is Monica Statler, and I am the Director of Graduate Training Programs here at ASPPH. In that role, I have the honor of working with ASPPH fellows who are placed with our partner organizations at CDC, the EPA, and NHTSA. Today's session, where public health and transportation collide, will be led by two of our ASPPH fellows who are based at the US Department of Transportation, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, or NHTSA. But first, a few housekeeping issues. At any time during the, today's presentation, you may click the Q&A box and enter your questions. All questions will be um, will be addressed and responded to at the end of today's presentation. But now to introduce our speakers. Today we, all, we welcome Ms. Morgan Drexler, a graduate of St. Louis College of Public Health and Social Justice and a second year ASPPH NHTSA Public Health Fellow. And Ms. Glenda Dora Dulce, a first year ASPPH NHTSA Public Health Fellow and a graduate of Emory University Rollins School of Public Health. Our aim today is not only to highlight the important work our fellows are doing under their fellowships at NHTSA, but also to raise awareness of, the tra of traffic safety as an important career path in the field of public health. I'll now hand over the presentation to Morgan and Glenn. Great, thank you, Monica. All right, to get us started here, I want to present to you the objectives that we're hoping you all take away from this presentation here today. So firstly, we want you to gain an understanding of motor vehicle safety, to determine the connection of public health to transportation. Thirdly, to recognize major risky driving behaviors. And lastly, to find your own role in creating a safe driving environment. So to get you thinking here, think of this question on your own, your answer to this. What do you think the role, if any, is for public health and transportation slash traffic safety? So where are your ideas currently between this relationship between public health and transportation? And think about how you can expand this answer as we move throughout the presentation. I'd also like you to think about how you can be a traffic safety advocate for your friends and family, and also potentially professionally, you can be a transportation advocate. Lastly, I wanna mention as we get started here, this week is National Teen Driver Safety Week. So if you know any teens in your life that you think they should learn some of these great takeaways, please do share those with them so they can become safer drivers also. So a lot of you on this webinar are likely very familiar with public health, but I want to take us back to the nitty gritty of what exactly is public health and read to you the definition that CDC has of the definition of public health. So it is the science and art of preventing disease, prolonging life and promoting health through the organized efforts and informed choices of society, organizations, public and private communities and individu individuals. So some key terms to pull out of that definition are gonna be preventing diseases and injuries, which I ad lib there, prolonging life, organized efforts, and informed choices. So consider these phrases as we move throughout the presentation, because you're gonna find a lot of connections between these specific terms to traffic safety. So traffic safety, we need to understand the definition of what exactly is traffic safety. You might also hear the terms road safety, transportation safety, or motor vehicle safety. But all these terms are working to encompass the same thing, to create a safe transportation environment to get all road users from one destination to the next destination safely. So these road users include drivers, passengers, pedestrians, bikers, even scooter users. Anyone that is utilizing the roadway is considered a road user. 
And within traffic safety, transportation professionals think about creating the safety environment through the utilization of the four E's. And those four E's are engineering, education, enforcement, and EMS or emergency, emergency medical services. So engineering is really encompassing that infrastructure, the physical roadway environment, and how we construct and maintain and design roadways to be the safest possible. It also encompasses vehicle manufacturing. So creating safety features within vehicles. That can include anything from tires to airbags to seat belts. Our second E is education. So education is all about informing the public, informing them about the rules of the road. So you can consider driver's education courses, educating the public about risky behaviors, and then educating them about how they can create positive behaviors behind the wheel to create the safest driving environment for themselves and their passengers. Our third E is enforcement. So this involves the laws and those rules of the road that are enforced and involves professionals like police, prosecutors, judges, and probation officials. Then our last E is emergency medical services and is the ambulatory response that would arrive to treat injuries on the scene if there were to be a traffic crash. Now we all came here today to learn about the collision between public health and transportation. So how do these two pieces come together? They really come together through three mechanisms, prevention, promotion, and education. They're coming together to create a safety culture environment through prevention. And it's all about getting people from point A to point B safely. Through organized efforts, professionals within transportation work to prevent injuries and fatalities through the utilization of those four E's that we just discussed. And now I'm gonna pass it over to Glenn to discuss with you a little bit more about public health and transportation. Thank you, Morgan. Trying to go to the next slide. Sorry about that. So here I will explain the public health approach. The public health approach is a four step process that is used within the field of public health to solve public health problems. Here I will describe how it's used within this uh, to solve problems such as traffic crash related injuries. So number one, define the problem. So here data is gathered, gathered from the National Center for Statistics and Analysis Data Collection System to analyze the data for any changes or trends. So here they are asking, what is the problem? Who is the problem affecting? Where is the problem located? Step two is to identify risk and protective factors. For here, in this second part, what factors are putting people at risk and what factors are protecting people from the risk of traffic crash injuries? This is where NHTSA's Office of Behavioral Safety Research comes. They conduct research on driving behaviors to develop countermeasures that will help with step three, developing and testing the prevention strategies. So here, data-driven evidence-based programs are developed and tested before widespread adoption. To assure widespread adoption, the last step, sorry, the last step is to assure widespread adoption. Here, knowledge is shared and funding may be provided to implement data-driven evidence-based programs within communities. Now here, I will explain why traffic safety is a public health issue. So as you can see from this table, unintentional injuries is the leading cause of death from ages one through 44. And with all ages is the leading cause of death Unintentional injuries is a leading cause of death for all ages. So this is why traffic safety is a public health issue. And I'm gonna explain further why in this next table. 
So here the table breaks down um, the different types of unintentional injury deaths. So as you can see, traffic crashes is the leading cause of death within ages five to 24. And overall, it is the second lead, leading cause of death within all ages. Therefore, unintentional injuries, from this slide, we can see why unintentional injuries kill more children and young adults than any other single cause in the US. And this is why this is a public health issue. When I look at this chart, I think about, you know, me personally. I have two younger brothers who fall into those age ranges of five to 24. They're young adults and they're young drivers. So when I think about this, I think about how it affects our general, you know, our general population overall, but also how it affects the people within our personal lives. So this is why this is an issue that we need to address because many times unintentional injuries are overlooked within the field of public health. Here, I will explain the social ecological model and how public health interventions are used within the traffic safety field to address the issue of injuries from car crashes. So in order to prevent traffic, traffic crash related fatalities, we must understand the different levels such as individual, relationship, community, and societal. Promoting safe driving behaviors requires a multi-dimensional approach in order to reach across levels over time. So at the individual level, the goal is to encourage positive attitudes for safe driving, increasing their knowledge and increasing their skills, such as you know, the technique of putting on a seatbelt or installing a child in a car seat. Within relationships, the individual's close circle will influence their driving behavior. And that goes on for within the community level, their social cir circles will influence their driving behaviors in addition to the society such as social norms. So the goal is to encourage an individual to practice safe driving behaviors through implementation of prevention methods across all levels, individual, relationship, community, and societal. Here I will explain the three levels of prevention and how it is implemented within transportation safety. So usually the three levels of prevention is used within public health, as we know, um, is commonly used for diseases, you know, primary, secondary, tertiary. But here in the transportation safety, we have pre-injury phase, injury phase, and post-injury phase. So for primary prevention or pre-injury phase, the goal is to prevent the injury before it occurs. An example of this would be traffic safety laws. For secondary or injury phase, the goal is to reduce the impact of the injury. For instance, it would be like your airbag within your vehicle. For tertiary phase, the goal is to treat the injury after it happens. So this is when the, emer the emergency medical systems come into play to treat those injuries. Back to you, Morgan. Thanks, Glenn. So now we're gonna consider NHTSA's mission here. So we discussed at the beginning that Glenn and I are ASPPH Public Health Fellows and our host office is NHTSA. So NHTSA is the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, which is an agency within the Department of Transportation located in Washington, DC, and is a federal government organization. So NHTSA's mission is to save lives prevent injuries and reduce economic costs due to road traffic crashes through education, research, safety standards, and enforcement activity. So NHTSA is really striving to save lives and prevent injuries, which is major public health concerns and focuses. And they're working to achieve that through the utilization of the four E's that we touched on at the beginning. So if you can recall with me, those four E's are engineering, education, enforcement, and EMS. So those are all activities at, that NHTSA employees, employees work to save lives and prevent injuries. Now let's take a look here at the data. 36,560. 
Take a second to consider what this number represents. Take a guess to yourself as to what you think this number is trying to tell us about traffic safety. So I'll give you a second here. So some of you probably are right on the money. 36,560 represents the total number of traffic fatalities in the United States during 2018. So in one year, this is how many deaths were seen on the roadways just in the United States. Now I want you to consider to yourself, is this an acceptable number of traffic fatalities? You're probably thinking no. So what would be an acceptable number of traffic fatalities? I hope you're thinking zero. Zero is an acceptable number of traffic fatalities. Although a long way off from 36,000, it's definitely something that is achievable. Now, when we look at traffic fatalities, fatalities is at the tip of the iceberg of the problem of traffic crashes. It's what we utilize at the most when we think about our data for um, traffic crashes and it guides us to um, solutions and it guides our programs and policies. But it is not the only thing. There is also injuries and costs associated with traffic crashes that we must consider. Injuries, we see about an estimated 3 million per year and that includes serious and severe injuries that lead to loss of quality of life and also cost. A staggering $75 billion per year is related to traffic crashes. That includes medical costs, insurance costs, and cost to the individual. I also want to note if you would like more information about fatalities and fatality level data to look into FARS. So the Fatality Analysis Reporting System, or FARS, is the data that NHTSA utilizes to guide programs, gives a picture of the problem, and allows us to monitor the problem of traffic fatalities. Now, look at these two terms, crash and accident. And consider these two terms as I present to you a scenario. Consider you are driving into the office still. This is pre-COVID times. So you've, you're driving into the office every day. One particular morning, you're headed out of your house. You have your coffee in hand and you get in your car. Uh, you buckle up, of course, and you're driving down the road headed into the office. You notice on your drive to work, up ahead of you on the road is a police car pulled over, their lights are on, clearly some sort of incident has happened, but you aren't sure what. As you get closer, an ambulance rushes up to the scene and medical personnel jump out. As you drive by, you notice two cars have collided. There's clearly a lot of frontal damage to both of the cars, a lot of physical damage, seems to be some injuries are have occurred to the people involved in the crash since the EMS personnel are there. But now what do you call this collision between the two cars? Do you call it a car crash? Or do you call it a car accident? Or maybe even motor vehicle crash or motor vehicle accident? Well, we want to encourage you to utilize the term crash. Crash is important to use when talking about car crashes because it implies that it was preventable. And through data, we know that over 90% of crashes are preventable. Now, accident almost implies that it was inevitable, it was bound to happen, but because of that data, we know these are preventable, so that's why we want you to utilize the term crash. It's almost an injustice to utilize the term accident because a person doesn't accidentally drive after drinking. A person doesn't accidentally text while driving. They are preventable activities that have serious and sometimes even deadly consequences. So you're probably asking, how do we reduce these crashes, injuries, and fatalities then? Well, we can do this 
by looking at human factors and human behavior and reducing risky behaviors of people while they're driving their vehicles and utilizing the roadway. So risky behaviors while driving include speeding or driving too fast for the conditions at hand, if it's maybe snowy or rainy outside, reckless behavior like driving through red lights, impaired driving, distracted driving, and also not buckling up while you're driving or as a passenger. Now, Glenn and I are gonna focus in here particularly on two of these risky behavior areas and because our within our host office at NHTSA, we are in the Office of Impaired Driving and Occupant Protection. So I'll focus in on impaired driving and Glenn's gonna then discuss with you about occupant protection. So to get us started here about impaired driving, let's consider what exactly is impaired driving. So when I'm talking about impaired driving, I'm talking about alcohol and drug use while driving or prior to driving and being impaired. So alcohol and alcohol impaired driver are drivers considered to be alcohol impaired when their blood alcohol concentration or BAC is 0.08 grams per deciliter or higher. So this is used as the set per se limit to deem if someone is alcohol impaired or not, because at this particular BAC, the average person has significant cognitive and motor skill disruptions, which include disruptions to balance, speech, reaction times are reduced. There's people have difficulty focusing, difficulty with judgment, and difficulty evading obstacles. And it, the risk of being involved in a fatal crash increases greatly at this particular BAC. So states enact laws around impaired driving and 49 out of 50 states have a BAC per se limit of 0.08 grams per deciliter or higher, which they deem as an alcohol impaired driver. The one state that does not have a 0.08 limit is Utah. They actually have a lower limit, which is stricter. So they have a 0.05 grams per deciliter or higher is what they deem to be an alcohol impaired driver. Now, drug impaired drivers are drivers impaired due to the intoxicating effects of recent drug use. And that can include illegal prescription or even over-the-counter drugs. Anything that impairs someone's cognitive ability to be able to drive safely. Overall, when you consider what is impaired driving, it's when a person's cognitive functioning is affected along with motor skills to negatively impact their ability to drive safely. So we really, the ultimate goal here with impaired driving prevention is to eliminate drunk driving, eliminate drug driving, and create safe driving behaviors among the public. So to get an idea and a scope of what exactly is the problem of impaired driving, I presented here on this screen a little bit about what is the data for alcohol impaired driving deaths. So in 2018, we saw 10,511 fatalities in motor vehicle crashes that involved at least one driver that was impaired by alcohol. That's a huge portion when you look at it in comparison to the total number of traffic fatalities in 2018, which was a little bit above 36,000. It accounts for nearly 30% of all traffic fatalities and is the leading cause of traffic fatalities, which is, and it has, has been and is a consistent problem on our roadways that we need to work to combat. To give you a picture of what's kind of been going on with impaired driving over the past few decades, we can take a look here at this graph. This graph is showing us from 1982 through 2018. So in 1982, there was around 21,000 total alcohol impaired driving fatalities on the roads in the US. And then over time, so in the 80s and 90s, we saw a lot of prevention mechanisms put into place around impaired driving, 
laws were enacted by states to prevent impaired driving and have consequences around it. So we saw a lot of progress over the next couple of decades throughout the 80s and 90s. And then if you look at those last two green cars, we see 2009 to 2018. We don't see as much progress right there. Although we've seen a significant decline in drunk driving fatalities since the 80s, there hasn't been a whole lot of progress over the last 10 years. And we're kind of seeing around 10,000 um, alcohol impaired driving fatalities each year. So some questions that this leaves me wondering are, why are people still driving drunk? Is it that they aren't educated enough about the dangers? Is it that they think it's okay to drive after just a few drinks? Is it that there's a greater substance use issue at hand? So a lot of lingering questions. But one thing is for certain, it is completely avoidable. No one ever has to get behind the wheel after consuming alcohol or being impaired by drugs. And we can work to combat the problem. So if we want to understand some high risk groups that we could focus prevention interventions on, we need to consider the data that is showing us who is at highest risk. So these particular groups are groups that have, uh, that engage or that are found to be alcohol impaired drivers who are involved in a fatal crash more often than other groups. So when we look at age, 21 to 34 year olds and are found to be an alcohol impaired driver involved in a fatal crash more often than the other age groups. Men sex, males are more likely than females to be an alcohol impaired driver. Vehicle type, motorcyclists are an overrepresented group followed closely by passenger cars and light pickup truck drivers. And then repeat offenders. So those people that have previously been convicted for impaired driving, we see that they are four times more likely to re-engage and be a repeat offender. So we can focus in and target these particular groups with prevention interventions. Also important to note that studies have shown us on average an impaired driving offender has driven impaired 80 times before being detained. So what that means is when an impaired driver is arrested, likely they have driven close to 80 times prior to that while being impaired. That means that each of those 80 other time, times they have put themselves, their passengers and other road users at risk. And we need to work to prevent those people from getting behind the wheel while they are intoxicated. So how do we combat this problem? NHTSA has four strategy areas to work to prevent the problem of impaired driving. The first strategy is deterrence, which is to discourage impaired driving by informing drivers of the consequences. So this really gets at that third E that we discussed at the beginning, which was enforcement. It's all about enacting, enforcing, and adjudicating laws around impaired driving. And those laws include BAC per se limits, like we discussed at the beginning of this section. It also includes open container laws. Laws that, those are laws that are talking about, you can't just have a beer cracked open next to you while you're driving down the street. Also sobriety checkpoints. So sobriety checkpoints, those are deemed legal or illegal by state. And if they're illegal, it allows law enforcement to be able to set up locations on the roadside um, on a particular night, typically weekend nights. They set these up and they standardly check all drivers coming through to see who is impaired or not. And then if someone is found and convicted of impaired driving, there's particular consequences that they face, like license revocation or suspension, the requirement to install an ignition interlock device into their vehicle, and also jail and, fine, and fines that they might face. Our second strategy is prevention. 
So we can look at prevention in two different ways. So Glenn talked about primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention at the beginning. So I'm gonna to touch on those again. So primary prevention is all about intervening before the problem can occur. So reducing drinking and drug use overall in the population. Secondary prevention is identifying the risky behavior as early as possible. So it's about keeping impaired people from driving. This can be done through educating bartenders and also educating them about responsible beverage service, encouraging the use of ride share, and also encouraging people to plan to have a designated sober driver. Our third strategy is communications, all about informing the public about the dangers of impaired driving and creating a positive social environment that makes drinking and driving completely unacceptable. NHTSA does this through the utilization of different campaigns. And you've probably seen some of the campaigns on national um, commercials or on billboards or radio ads. And a lot of times there's commercials around holiday season, sporting events, different things like that. And you can find more on the particular campaigns on trafficsafetymarketing.gov. So with impaired driving, we see a few particular campaigns. We have the buzz driving is drunk driving campaign drive sober or get pulled over. And then these last two really focus in on drug impaired driving. If you feel different, you drive dr different and drive high, get a DUI. And our last and fourth strategy is treatment. So to reduce the prevalence of substance use disorders within the population. So here we need to consider access to treatment and how we can improve that access to treatment and reach the root of substance use issues that some people may have. And overall, we can achieve this by expanding access to care and utilizing health promotion tactics. All right, to wrap it up here and to get you guys engaged, we have a few true or false qu polling questions that are gonna pop up on your screen. Aaron, if you could pull those up. All right, so if you guys could work your way through these four questions, we have four true or false. So the first one is crash implies a motor vehicle collision was preventable. Secondly, over 36,000 fatalities were related to impaired driving in 2018. Third, 49 out of 50 states have a BAC limit of 0.05 as the per se limit for all compared driving. And the last question, I never drive impaired. So I'll give you guys a few seconds to complete those polling questions. Awesome. So that first question, the answer is true. So 75% of you got that correct. We really encourage you to utilize the term crash. Secondly, our question of over 36,000 fatalities were related to impaired driving in 2018. It's a little bit of mixed response here. This question is false. So the correct answer would be over um, about 10,000 fatalities were related to impaired driving. 36,000 relates to the total number of traffic fatalities in 2018. Third question, 49 out of 50 states have a BAC limit of 0.05 as the per se limit for alcohol impaired driving. This question is also false. So over 57% of you got that right. So actually it's 49 out of 50 states have a BAC limit of 0.08. Utah has that 0.05 limit. And lastly, 
really exciting to see. The majority of you have never driven impaired. Great. So now I'm gonna pass it over to Glenn to discuss with you guys a little bit more about occupant protection. Thank you, Morgan. So here I'll be talking about occupant protection and the things that are happening within the occupant protection division at NHTSA. So the occupant protection division at NHTSA strives to encourage safe driving behavior such as seatbelt use through data-driven programs that are, that are developed through the intersection of public health and behavioral change theories. So here are the four, four focus areas within the occupant protection division. So here you have to increase seatbelt use, increase car seat and booster seat use to eliminate distracted driving and to eliminate pediatric vehicular heat stroke deaths, also known as hot car deaths. So here I'm gonna describe what is the problem within each of these focus areas and what we, were, what we are doing to combat these issues. First is the public health, first is the seatbelt use. 47% of occupants killed in a traffic crash were not restrained during the crash. There are occupants who are still not wearing their seatbelt and this is very important to note. Secondly, seatbelt laws vary per state. To explain this more, there are primary seatbelt seat law states and secondary seatbelt law states. Primary seatbelt laws are enforced within states to increase seatbelt use. Primary seatbelt laws allow police to ticket an occupant for solely not wearing their seatbelt. However, not all states have a primary seatbelt law in place. In a secondary seatbelt law state, the officer could only issue a citation for non-seatbelt use if another offense has taken place, such as speeding or running a red light. Therefore, an officer will pull them over for that offense and in addition, give them a, a ticket for their seatbelt citation. 15 states have secondary laws for adult front seat occupants. 11 states have secondary laws for rear seat occupants. New Hampshire is the only state with a, without a primary or secondary seatbelt law. Next, I'll go into car seat and booster seat use. Car seat and booster seat use is the most effective way to protect a child in a crash. However, car seats are often used incorrectly. Car seats reduce the risk of injury in a crash by 71 to 82% for children. And within a booster seat use, it reduces the risk of serious injury by 45% for children ages four to eight. This is why it's really important for children to be properly installed within their car seat and booster seat. Another issue is that unrestrained drivers are more likely to not restrain their child occupants. What does this mean? This means that drivers who do not practice safe driving behavior such as putting on their seatbelt, they are more likely to not restrain their child within a proper car seat or not install them at all using the seatbelt. Third, traffic crashes are the leading cause of death within children and youth. From the previous slides, I showed how uh, children in the young adult population are at high risk for injuries from car crashes. And this is really important to note. Within distracted driving, an estimate of 400,000 people were involved in a traffic crash that involved a distracted driver in 2018. Another issue is that handheld cell phone use is the highest among 16 to 24 year old drivers. Distracted driving is one of the fastest growing safety issues on our roads today. Now for pediatric vehicular heat stroke deaths, also known as hot car deaths. Heat stroke is one of the leading causes of non-crash related fatalities among children. Vehicular Vehicular heat stroke happens when a child is left in a hot car. 54% hot car deaths happen because a child is unknowingly left in a car. 46% of the time when a child was unknowingly left in a car, the caregiver meant to drop off the child at daycare or preschool. The second common reason for 
a child dying from a hard car death is that 25% of hot car deaths happen because a child enters in an unintended vehicle. Here you can see that 52 hot car deaths occurred in 2019. This is the second highest number to be recorded. And currently within 2020, 24 hot car deaths occurred. The pandemic is likely to be responsible for this number, but this has been the lowest number of deaths recorded since 2015. Unfortunately, the latest hot car death occurred this month within October. Now here I will explain primary prevention methods used within the Occupant Protection Division in order to promote safe driving behaviors such as those four focus areas, increasing seatbelt use, increasing car seat and booster seat, eliminated distracted driving, and eliminating hot car deaths. As you remember from the previous slides, primary prevention, is, it seeks to prevent the injury before it occurs. At NHTSA's Occupant Protection Division, primary prevention methods such as um, education programs, enforcement programs, and laws are implemented to protect occupants within their vehicles when they're on the road. So here I will explain how primary prevention is used to increase seatbelt use. Primary seatbelt laws are one method. So as I stated before, primary seatbelt laws allow police to ticket occupants for solely not wearing a seatbelt. Primary seatbelt laws are in effect in 35 states and in four US territories for adult front seat occupants. It is also in effect in 25 states, DC and two territories for rare seatbelt use. Primary seatbelt laws help to decrease traffic crashes on, in contrast to states who have adopted secondary seatbelt laws. Next is enforcement programs. Ticket or Click It is a high visibility enforcement campaign that intersects education and law enforcement to increase seatbelt use within our nation. It is highly publicized through media campaigns. You may see it on your TV commercials or see ads, but this is an intervention to increase seatbelt use. Together, Enforcement programs such as Ticket or Click It and laws such as primary seatbelt laws unitedly are, are used together to help increase seatbelt use. Next, I will talk about prevention interventions within child passenger safety. So the goal is to increase car seat and booster seat use among children. As you see here, you have education programs, distribution programs, and laws which all are combined together to increase car seat and booster seat use among children. For education programs, you have educational material and cam campaigns that are produced to increase car seat use. In addition, child passenger safety, safety technicians are certified to educate parents and caregivers on proper car seat installation. I am a child passenger safety technician, so I, I have had the opportunity to educate caregivers and, parent, and grandparents or caregivers um, on how to properly install their child in car seats, help them to choose the correct car seat, and that has been an honor to do that. For distribution programs, they provide car seats and education on proper installation. So basically, free car seats are provided to parents and caregivers. In addition to that, education is provided on how to install those car seats. So it's a two-in-one type of program. And then you have laws. Child passenger restraint laws vary by state. In all states, DC, Puerto Rico, they require that booster seats for children who have outgrown their car seats but are too small to, be, to use an adult seatbelt. In 23 states, DC and the Virgin Islands, they require children younger than two to be in a, in a rare facing car seat. So with all, with all these three prevention mechanisms, education programs, distribution programs, and laws, you use, they are used all together to increase car seat and booster seat within the child population. Next, I will talk about distracted driving. 
and the prevention interventions used to eliminate distracted driving. For education and enforcement, you have the UTEX, you drive, you text, you pay campaign that combines education, highly visible enforcement and communications through media. Next, you have distracted driving laws. Within 48 states, DC, Puerto Rico, Guam, and the US Virgin Islands, they banned texting, text messaging for all drivers. In 25 states, DC, Puerto Rico, Guam, and the US Virgin Islands, they ban driving while talking on a handheld phone. The You Drive, You Text, You Pay campaign normally takes place during Distracted Driving Awareness Month. And this year, Distracted Driving Awareness Month took place in the beginning of October. Lastly, I will talk about preventive interventions for hot car deaths. So the public is educated about the dangers of hot vehicles and not to leave their children within vehicles. This occurs through a campaign, Park, Look, Lock. This is basically, basically a campaign that reminds caregivers or parents to make sure to look, you know, and to make sure that they are not leaving their child in the car and to also lock the car to make sure the child does not enter an unintended vehicle. Lastly, I will connect the social ecological model that I explained in previous slides and how, to, how it's applied within the Occupant Protection Division. So at the individual level, educational programs are geared towards changing the occupant's behavior and encouraging safe driving behaviors such as seatbelt use and driving without distractions. Second, in order to affect the relationship level, peer family-focused educational programs such as pass child passenger safety resources for parents and caregivers are provided. At the community level, tra traffic safety campaigns and community programs within schools, child care facilities, workplace, hospital systems, local health departments, um, are implemented with, within those areas. For example, you have seatbelt use campaigns within schools. And another example are car seat distribution programs or car seat checks within communities. And at the societal level, you have primary seatbelt laws that are implemented, child passenger restraint laws, handheld cell phone use laws, and national campaigns such as click it or ticket, or you drive, you text, you pay, and park, look, and lock. So the overall goal is to show how each level, individual, relationship, community, and societal, and how prevention methods are applied within each level to encourage the individual to practice safe driving behaviors. So now we'll have some true or false quote questions. So if you can take a few seconds to answer these questions. Uh, number one, true or false injuries from traffic crashes are the leading cause of death in children and young adults. Number two, it is okay to respond to a quick text when driving. It will only take one second. Number three, all states have primary seatbelt laws. And number four, I always buckle up. So for number one, I, most of you selected true, which is a correct answer. It is true that injuries from traffic crashes are the leading cause of death in children and young adults. Number two, 100% of you guys selected false, which is correct. It is not okay to respond to a quick text when driving. Number three, false is the correct answer all states do not have primary seatbelt laws. And number four, most of you guys selected true. I always buckle up 97%, that's good. 
Thank you for answering. And back to you, Morgan. Thanks, Glenn. So now that you guys have a great overview of the connection between motor vehicle safety and public health, we just wanna wrap up a little bit here on how you can utilize what we learned today in your own life to be a traffic safety advocate and potential mechanisms for you to engage in professionally too. So first out, I wanna start out with helping you develop your personal motive or your why is an important mechanism to do while you're becoming a traffic safety advocate to be a safer driver for yourself and your friends and family. So for example, my personal motive would be that I wanna be a safer driver and encourage my friends and family to do the same and have safe driving habits because I don't want anyone missing from holiday events. I don't want an open seat at the table due to a traffic fatality. And then connect that personal motive to your community and think about other families and things like along those lines and encouraging those safe driving habits among the other drivers that you are driving amongst when you are on the road or when you're a pedestrian thinking about the other drivers on the road, you want them also to have safe driving behaviors to protect yourself. So develop a plan of action as to how you are gonna be a safer driver and encourage those around you to be a safer driver and pedestrian and bike, bike user, any type of road user. So considering things like, I'm always gonna buckle up when I get in a vehicle and I'm gonna encourage all my passengers to always do the same, no exception. Um, maybe considering I'm gonna put my phone in the back seat so I remove that temptation while I'm driving. Um, I'm never gonna drive impaired and if I host a party where I'm serving alcohol, I will ensure that all my friends and family that are attending the event have a safe and sober ride home or can stay at my place so they until they are sober enough or until they are sober to drive home. So those are some actions you can take and think about different mechanisms you can employ within your own life to have safer driving habits and to encourage those around you to do the same. And also considering that it is National Teen Driver Safety Week, share some of these tips and what you learned here today with a teen in your life. And then let's connect back to the social ecological model, which Glenn shared with us. So we touched a lot on individual and relationship level, but also think about how you can connect to your community, maybe doing something within a school to encourage students to have safe driving behaviors, some sort of educational campaign. And then societally, maybe you want to engage as a professional within transportation and work within transportation like Glenn and I are doing through our fellowship and work maybe even at the national level at somewhere like NHTSA. So we really do encourage you all to have those safe driving habits and to encourage those around you to do the same. One last thing here to wrap us up. Sorry. There we go. So we do have an opportunity to present to all of you. So Glenn and I would like to offer a guest lecture to classes, whether that is whether you are a faculty member, a staff member at a university, undergrad or graduate programs, we would like to offer to come in and do a presentation similar to what we've done here today and even dive further into depth on occupant protection and impaired driving topics and do a 45 to 60 minute lecture for your particular class. And we would allow for an interactive dialogue and engage with them about how they can incorporate public health concepts into transportation and potentially even have transportation as a career path. So you can contact 
myself and Glenn to set something up. If you are interested in that, it would obviously be virtual right now. And also please do connect with us both on LinkedIn and you'll get our contact information also in a follow-up email too. But we really appreciate all of your time here today, learning about traffic safety and the connection to public health. And we are open to answering any questions that you have. If you can type those in the Q&A pod, we would love to answer those for you. So I saw a few come in. All right, so our first question here is, do you see differences in traffic crashes by counties with high income versus low income or countries with high income versus low income or rural versus urban areas in the US? Okay, I think they meant county. I assume that streets are more densely packed in low and middle income counties as well as in urban areas. If so, what can be done? So um, traffic crashes, I believe the data is showing us that rural areas have a greater percentage of traffic crashes and considering they have the less populations, definitely a major focus area and it's actually a particular focus of the Secretary of the Department of Transportation. So there are efforts around incorporating more um, rural transportation um, tactics to encourage safe driving and safe road use within those areas. And then someone said we made a great point about the term accident versus crash, but how can we advance this language? In their classes, faculty still use the term accident. So I would make a plug here for Glenn and I to be able to do a presentation like we did here to um, explain that. Also may, encouraging you to speak up within your class and be like, hey, I learned this during a webinar recently. I think maybe it'd be a good idea for us to be able to utilize the term crash over accident. Glenn, someone asked, where do I find a car seat technician to educate themselves on car seats? Yeah, so one way you can find a technician is through the safekids.org. And there you can find a technician within your community. Um, it will show their phone number and you can contact them and they will be there. And it's for free. All the services are for free, which is a great thing. And then it looks like we are getting close to time so we can answer one more question. So someone asked, do you think there's been a reduction in alcohol impaired crashes as a result of access to Uber and Lyft? So definitely an important mechanism that helps to encourage people to have a safe ride home and really improves that access to a safe ride home. So I don't know about exact connections and associations there, but it's definitely a helpful pre prevention mechanism. All right, so we do appreciate all those questions. If you do have lingering questions, please do email Glenn and myself and we would be more than happy to answer those questions for you. And then our references are listed here for any data that we presented to you. And you will be able to view a recording of this if you want to watch it again or send it on to anyone that you think would be interested in learning about this topic. And lastly, we just want to thank our generous fellowship program with ASPPH and also our host office of NHTSA and we also truly appreciate everyone that joined this webinar today and hope you learned a lot about public health and the connection to transportation.